as I say, we'd never met before till last night, heard much about him. And um, from the minute we sat down, I don't know if you felt this, but I felt like we had a kindred spirit. And uh, that God wants to do something special at Carlmont Christian Center today, this morning and tonight. And so I want you to open your hearts to the word of the Lord. And uh, he's going to introduce his wife to us in just a moment. So open your hearts to the word of the Lord and let God do in you what he wants to do today. How many of you are open to the Lord? You're good ground. Well, let's receive today in Jesus' name. God bless you. My, what a time. I'm enjoying being here already. It's good to find a church where there's a move of the Holy Spirit and people are open to the things of God. That's what makes a good church. Can you say amen to that? Yes. Amen. Keep it up and you're going to have a baptizing service. If you haven't been baptized, for heaven's sakes, get baptized. I was born and raised a Southern Baptist. We believe in baptizing. Yeah. Amen. And hopefully you're converted first, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not a member of the church, for heaven's sakes, join the church. It's the only, th only organization that's going to exist forever. That's right. The rest of the clubs are going down, so... When they sing the, chord, the song, when the roll's called up yonder, I'll be there, where do you think he's going to get the roll call? From the church preacher. Yeah. So be sure your name's on the list. <laughs> I trust you understand I am facetious at this point. <laughs> now, I do want to introduce Mrs. Lindsay. Honey, stand up, won't you? Everybody take a look. Give her a hand. Her <laughs> here. I always introduce her before I speak, particularly when we're new at a place. I understand at one place, Dr. Phil Hogan, one of our own people, was speaking, had spoken. His wife had not been introduced. She was sitting in the congregation. After he had spoken, then the church was all, sometime in the church, and they greet each other and tell them they're glad to see him, you know, and haven't seen him for a few days. And They were doing that, and uh, a lady in the church seeing Mrs. Hogan realized she must be a stranger. She leaned over and said, are you a stranger here? Mrs. Hogan said she was. Your first time? She said, that's right. Then the lady, trying to be helpful, says, I hope you'll come back. We generally have better preaching than this around here. <laughs> so now that, you, now that you know who she is, you may not make that mistake. <laughs> It was a delight for us last night to meet Pastor and Mrs. Cook, and immediately we enjoyed their spirit, and as he said, felt like we were kindred spirits. That's a great feeling or sensation, and makes it delightful for us to be here and minister to you. And we're here today concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That will be our message this morning. And tonight I'll be discussing the subject of the Holy Spirit and healing. Don't miss it. It'll be well worth your time. We were in one church and had spoken on the subject and gave an invitation for those who wanted to be healed. Quite a number came forward. One young lady came forward and I said, what is your difficulty? And with clenched teeth, she says, I have M jaw. That's that temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. She couldn't open her mouth, and that's bad for a lady. <laughs> I'll probably hear from this one, but... You get to move on. I have... <laughs> we prayed for her, and her mouth flew open, and she screamed in front of that church, I can open my mouth. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Well, there's a lot of good things we want to tell you what God is doing. Don't miss it. It's for you. Bring your friends and enemies. God will heal them. Praise the Lord forever. 
<clears throat> now this morning I'm going to speak concerning the doctrine of the baptism of the Spirit. It will be didactic, a teaching message, of course. And uh, then we we'll, are going to invite forward those who should, who should like to receive their baptism of the Spirit. Incidentally, lest I forget, we do have tapes and uh, books in the foyer. Ms. Lindsay will be taking care of those. Everything I say this morning will be on tapes. By the way, I feel I wish I was here a week. <laughs> Amen. Can't say it all in one service, but we have those out there. And for those of you who are interested, we also have a disc and a tape of one of my sons who's an Air Force chaplain. Single boy, doing a good job. And you'll enjoy that, of course. Hallelujah. Now someone, well, Christianity Today reported it. Some time ago, a survey was taken. And uh, it has been found that perhaps 19% of the adult American population consider themselves charismatic or Pentecostal. And, uh, but out of this 19%, now what is it, 30, 35 million people perhaps, only 5 million say they speak with tongues. Now, there are around 10 million Roman Catholics in the United States today who speak in tongues. How many of you believe Catholics can say? Do you believe that? Amen. You better believe they do. They sing and dance around the rosy like we used to. <laughs> God's moving in a mighty way among those people. There are over 500 million tongues-talking Christians in the world today. That's Barrett's report, the great British statistician. Now, when you give these statistics, they're all of a sudden out of date because we're growing at the rate of 54,000 per day. That's 20 million a year. Now, a lot, the majority of that's in third world countries where revival is sweeping, sweeping over them. And uh, when the church in China came out from the underground, they found 29 million tongues talking Chinese. So what we're doing is not something new, not at all. It's been ever for 2,000 years now since Pentecost first occurred. Uh, President Van Dusen of Princeton Seminary many years ago said the last half of the 20th century would be called the era of the Holy Spirit. And he certainly was correct on that score. Now I'm going to be very upfront with you. I've been a Navy chaplain, been in the Navy for 28 years. You can't have been in the Navy that long without being affected. And so I speak very straightforwardly. I have no hidden agendas. I say what I mean and mean what I say. Amen. I love that Marine store. Oh. And if I had time to tell you the story, we had 323 Marines get saved in one camp I was in. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. But anyway, i got to go on here. But, uh, so I'm going to be very straightforward so I can communicate with you. And I've been told I'm not hard to understand. <laughs> now, I've given you a survey. Let me take a survey this morning. Will you be up front with me? Say a good amen. Yeah. All right, I want a show of hands. How many of you have not yet received your prayer language? Let me see your hand. You have not yet received your baptism. Raise them up all over. Well, praise God. That's wonderful. I admire your honesty. At the close of this service, I will give an invitation. And when I do, I want you to respond immediately and promptly. Amen. <laughs> because when you know where you're going, there's no reason to drag it out, is there? That's right. That's right. <laughs> and then we'll get out in time to beat the Baptists down to the restaurants. <laughs> But really, that's what we're here for, isn't it? Yes. Get all God has for us. That's right. And that's what we want to do this morning. Now, let me say here in prefacing my remarks, to receive your baptism of the Holy Spirit, no perfectionism will be required on your part. Some of you ought to be glad to find that out. In fact, there are no perfect people. Contrary to some opinions, there is no perfect holiness. Thank you. And if someone ever approaches you and say they have attained perfect holiness or sanctification or sinless perfection, make yourself a mental note they're out to lunch. <laughs> or 
or they don't understand the terms, one or the other, you know. Or if that were the case, they made their first mistake when they told you that. No, there's no... Now, I say these things because in our church we have many good people who don't come for what God has for them because they let their negative thoughts keep them back. Knowing they're not perfect or knowing that everything is not just right. I can't come now. Honey, there's no better time in the world to come in right now. And if you're going to wait until you get all of life's problems worked out before you come to God, you're not coming. No, we live with problems. That's life. You always come to God just as you are, in whatever state you find yourself. Whatever imperfections you have, that's, where you, that's when you come. Hallelujah. Now we need to know this. So get that, banish that kind of thinking from your mind. If you're God's child, God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and He will take you just as you are. Uh, and now, now when I talk like this, you know, some people get the idea, and, and it's, it's been said, Reverend, in some circles, that Lindsay doesn't believe in holiness. <clears throat> yes, I do believe in holiness, properly understood. Yes. <laughs> I asked one fellow one time, well, what do you think holiness is? He says it means you don't drink, smoke, chew, or go to movies. <laughs> I think that's a pretty shallow view of holiness. Yeah. There are people in the world who are not even saved who don't drink, smoke, chew, or go to movies. Not because they're holy, just that they just got good sense. <laughs> <laughs> so you can not do that and still not be holy. You know. Now we need to know these kind of things. I was, I was in a church one time, good church. And that evening, I think we had eight or ten received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, that's pretty good. That's not too bad, you know. And after the service, I was still at the podium. A lady came right up the middle aisle, shaking her bony finger as she came down the aisle. She approached the podium and says, may I speak with you? Now, when you interpret that, women don't ask that question. She was saying, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Being the kind man that I'm, I say, yes, you might she said, do you mean to tell me? And then she paints over a picture. A guy's been out last night boozing and carousing, going with him. What if they do, they do out there? Do you mean to tell me if he comes to these altars tonight, God will fill him with the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah, you got it right. That's what I said. <laughs> she says, I can't believe that. Now, she must have had a problem because God didn't and I didn't. <laughs> I said, well, what do you want him to do? Now, they don't like what you do, but they don't know what else to do. That's you know. right. I said, what do you want him to do? Well, but doesn't he have to repent? I said, but of course. But the fact he's in our church, he's come forward for prayer, isn't that indicative of repentance? I think it is. Now, she was an old liner. I know what she wanted. She wanted him to publicly lay on the floor and bawl and squall and make a big scene. That would her would be repentance. I've seen people do that and never change their ways. Repentance means change of heart, change of ways. Let me put it down on a lower level. Now you men don't react. Men don't smile. Don't nudge your wife. Don't do anything now. You ever get crossways with your wife? You did something or said something, you know, been a little friction there, and you've, after all, you begin to say, well, you know, I shouldn't have done it. Just talk to yourself. And, uh, so you want to get things straightened out, you know. Now, she's in the kitchen doing the dishes, maybe. Do you walk in the kitchen and kneel on the floor and say, honey, I'm a terrible sinner. Lay hands on me and absolve me of my sins? Yes. <laughs> No, what you probably do is <laughs> you probably you know, kind of walk into the kitchen, you know, and you don't know what to say really, and you walk past her and kind of give her a tap on the backside maybe, and you say, honey, you want me to help you do dishes? <laughs> Any man who'll do dishes has repented. 
all I'm showing you to repent it means you're trying to get things straight. That's all it means. You can throw all the books out. That's what it means. You're trying to get your heart right, get straight with God or people, whatever the case may be. Now, we will not require that you tarry X number of hours. That's right. Tarrying, how many of you know what word tarry means? Raise your hand, you know? Well, you've been through some of it, haven't you? We've got a few assembly people here. <laughs> Tarrying, the old tarry meetings, their tarrying has produced more unbelief than you can imagine. We've had good people from the denominations who believed that when we told them about the Holy Spirit, they came to our churches, we told them to tarry, they tarried, they didn't get it. Finally, they began to feel like second-class citizens, and we let them feel like second-class citizens. They began to wonder, why don't I get it? We began to wonder, why don't they get it? They left our churches being good people went back to the denominational churches and began to be leaders in those churches. Nothing wrong with them. We just didn't know what to do to help them. And let me say something here, whether you speak in tongues or whether you don't, there are no second class citizens in the church. All God's people are first class citizens. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 All of God's people, first class citizens. Hallelujah. You should tarry after you receive the baptism to de be what God wants you to be or seek the leading of the Lord. Now, another thing, no feelings will be required to receive the baptism of the Spirit. Now, I need to say these things because sometimes, and I don't know all of you, or we've seen other, we've been other places, we've seen people get hilarious maybe, run around the church five times, stuff like that, you know, and uh, I'm not against that. If you want to run around the church, it's yours. I won't run with you. I'll cheer you as you make the laps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm saying is that's not necessary. That's all I'm saying. Feelings have done. We don't care how you feel. Just come get it. <laughs> that's all. And if you jump and shout, we'll worship God with you. If you simply calmly, coldly talk in tongues, we'll worship God with you. Let God be God. Let each individual be himself. There is no prescribed way of doing this. Hallelujah. Well, where am I at in the inspired notes here? Let's see. All right. Now, I suppose then we can begin by saying that it appears in the Old Testament era God was a respecter of people simply because in the Old Testament everybody did not receive the Holy Spirit in fact only the people of authority and position as the kings the priests the judges uh, the redeemers who came around from time to time and the prophets it seemed that they only enjoyed the moving of the Spirit and even then that was a spasmodic moving thing the Holy Spirit did not come upon them to remain upon them or within them as we understand it today now that was the way it was in the Old Testament era and of course the common men and women were simply followers in the camp they did what they were told period that was it you see and uh, so Joel the prophet coming along some 835 years prior to the time of Jesus Christ and under the anointing of predictive prophecy made this statement in Joel 2 and 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit now, Joel is simply saying from his vantage point, of course you never saw this, the time is coming in which God will no longer be a respecter of people, but he will give the Holy Spirit to anybody and everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord, and they shall be saved. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Hallelujah. I have no trouble with Joel 2.28 Joel, Joel 2, when he says that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I believe he meant exactly that. I like what you said about the word. I believe it means what it says. I have no trouble with that. That means he can pick a man, a woman, a boy or a girl, no matter where he finds him, no matter what kind of sin he's in, no matter what kind of a gutter, he can save him and fill him right there. That's what it means. Hallelujah. And that's what he wants to do. Well, we've got to skip the 800 years, find ourselves in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. 
John Baptist has come on the scene. He says in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, or whose shoelaces I am not worthy to reach down and untie. He shall baptize you with the fiery Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Now, the prophecy in Israel has been closed for 400 years. That's the white pages between the Testaments. No prophecy. It's been 800 years since Joel prophesied. When John Baptist comes on the scene, he comes after the order of an Old Testament prophet. In fact, Jesus considered him the spirit of Elijah. Rough-hewn, tough-talking man, straightforward man. And he's pre preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he talks about this baptism. Now, these are all Jews, understand. When John comes on the scene preaching, they go, they hear John, they believe John, they accept what John says. They had no trouble with this. Now, of course, John was not doing a new thing here. The Jews have always had baptisms. They've always had messages of repentance. That's not new. And when John was baptizing, that was not new. They understood this. In fact, that's where we get it. It's from their practice. And uh, so they understood that. They're going to John, confessing their sin, and being baptized by John in Jordan. Now, I do have to back up one thing here, back up on one thing. There was one new thing here. When John says, I baptize you with water, but he that is Christ shall baptize you with the fiery Holy Spirit. Now, for the first time, we have mention of a spirit baptism. Now, bear in mind, the Jews have always known of the Holy Spirit. That was not new. Moses said the Spirit of God grew on the face of the waters. The prophets came along, Joel for one, then other prophets uh, speaking of the, of the Holy Spirit. They knew that. But for the first time it's called a baptism with the Holy Spirit. And Christ will baptize his people with the Holy Spirit. Now when he says that, then we have two baptisms on our hands. One is water, one is spirit. The pastor baptizes men and women in the element of water. Jesus Christ baptizes his people in the element of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Now there's one more baptism we must, must be familiar with, and that's the baptism into the body of Christ, as is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and it reads like this. For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made also to drink into one Spirit. Now we've got a new thing here. We have a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in this case, it is the Holy Spirit who deals with a man or woman, boy or girl, brings them to a place of a need of repentance, and a desire for eternal life, a need for a Redeemer, points the person to Jesus Christ. And when the person makes a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit then puts places, sets, or baptizes that one into the body of Christ. Yes. Then the term baptized is simply used in a metaphorical sense, simply meaning to place in or to put in. And of course, that's what he does. I like the better reading in the New International Version of the end of that verse. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Now here you have a drink thing. In other words, when we came to Jesus, all of us who ever got saved, when we came to Jesus, we took a drink or we took a sip of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. Now, Paul says in Romans 8 9, when we have to understand this, that all Christians have the Holy Spirit. This is not debatable. I don't give it up to you for de debate at all. And if you don't know it, you're a sub-Christian. Before he says in Romans 8 9, if a man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So then, we, and then he says in 1 Corinthians 3 16, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And listen, honey, all evangelical Christians read this and believe this. You know, we're not the only people God has. If we are, he's pretty hard up. <laughs> No, he's got a lot of people out there in the other churches. I think they'll all be here, but obviously they're not. But no, 
All Christians have the Holy Spirit. I emphasize this point for those of you who were honest enough to show a need, realize you already have the Holy Spirit. There is no second reception of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. This is what gets me in trouble with you. There is no second reception of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You receive him once for all when you get saved. I mean, that's just biblical terms. That's all interested to that. But now that you know that, now let's look what we've got here. It should make it easier. Now, there's two terms I can use here. I better say this. There's two good equally biblical terms we can use. One is to say receive the baptism of the Spirit. The other is to say we're going to manifest the Holy Spirit. Either, either term is good. I use the term manifest the Spirit because to tell someone you're going to receive the baptism of the Spirit, some people get the idea they're going to receive something they did not have, the Holy Spirit, and that is not true. You're going to manifest the Spirit you received when you got saved. So simple and we've stumbled at it so long. We made it difficult. You could have talked in tongues when you got saved had you known it. Had someone told you about it. Had someone not told you you couldn't. We're playing catch up ball today. We got Acts 8 all over. But that's where we are and it's okay. No, you receive the Holy Spirit. So when we pray with you, all you're going to do is open your mouth and begin to worship in the spiritual language that God gives, Christ gives you. So simple. We've had people come to our altars, and in Pentecost Church, I don't know, we're a fearful people sometimes. The Baptist Methodists don't know enough to be afraid, but we get scared. And uh, <laughs> people come to the altar, I want to know what God's going to do to me. <laughs> As if God's going to drop the axe on them. No, 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 not at all. Rather, in thankfulness, we raise our hearts and our hands, and as he begins to move, we simply let the spiritual language begin to flow, something we could have done a long time ago. In fact, some of you will say, well, I could have done that a long time ago. The answer is, of course you could. But you didn't know you could until I told you you could, and then you did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Marvelous, marvelous. Praise God. So you're not to expect, when we pray with you, you're not to expect an absentee spirit to come down from heaven into you. That's eerie, isn't it? <laughs> That's scary. No, no, no. Rather, the Holy Spirit who is already in you will give you the ability to manifest his presence in the speaking in tongues. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Marvelous. If you're not saved... Come anyway, he'll save you and give it to you at the same time. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> I was with uh, Harold Duncan in Lodi, big church, a marvelous church. We were praying for the sick one night. And I thought we'd prayed for everybody. And Brother Duncan said, Chaplain, here's one more. Young man about 30. I said, What's your difficulty? He said, I want to get saved. That's refreshing, isn't it? <laughs> I said, all right. I led right there to the altar. I led him in a sinner's prayer and he asked God to save him. I said, now God saved you and the Holy Spirit came in. Now raise your hand and begin to worship with me in tongues. He raised both hands and started talking in tongues. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's right. Hallelujah. You don't have to know everything. All you have to do is do it. That's right. So simple. That is the manifestation. All right, let's move on. Well, uh, of course, John had finished his ministry. Jesus uh, is coming toward the end of his ministry. He's been teaching, preaching, healing, comforting. The time has come he's going to go away, but yet he said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. Now, wait a minute. What do we have here? I'm going to go away, but I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. That's paradoxical, isn't it? You can't do both, huh? But let's, have, let's see the res resolution that is given in John chapter 14. John, yeah, 14, let me find it. John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking. He says, I will pray the Father, verse 16, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Do you believe that? Yes. You better believe. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. 
When he says, I'll send another comforter, this implies one on equality, same capability. He can do what Jesus did. And in, verse, in John 16, verse 7, he says, it is expedient for you, it is necessary, it is advantageous for you that I go away, for if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. Now, the idea of this text, rationale of the text simply is, Jesus in the flesh was limited to the time-space concept. Jesus the man could only be at one place at any one given time. If that were still the case today, if he were here, no one else could have him. If they were there, we wouldn't have him. But when he would go away and return in the person and power of the Holy Spirit and indwell the hearts of his people, now it can be said where two or three are assembled in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And we sense his presence here this morning. Now, in John 14, verse 17, if you want to look at your Bibles, do. There's something we need to understand here that some of us Pentecostals don't seem to understand. In verse 17, the last verse, you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I've heard some of our people tell a good saved Baptist. Now, there are some saved Baptists. How many of you know that? <laughs> Methodist, Presbyterian, yeah. We just had a revival in Methodist Church in Maryland, but that, oh, well, anyway. But sure, there are saved people in all these churches. But we, I've, some, I've heard one of our person tell a person of another denomination using this text, the ho trying to prove the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they said, the Holy Spirit is with you now. But when you get the baptism, then he's going to be in you. And they use this text. You can't do that. That's not true. When Jesus made the statement, he dwells with you and shall be in you, it had not happened yet. This is a prophetic text. It's going to happen. It has not happened. At the time written, it had not happened. It did happen at Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit's been in the world ever since. You can't use this anymore. He's already here. Now, it's better that I tell you this than some Baptist corner you got there and tell you in this. <laughs> at least I'm one of us, you know. No, you have to understand the text. This is a prophetic text, and it was fulfilled at the day of Pentecost. Now, another thing, uh, uh, one way to read this also is, the Spirit, dwelt with the, the Spirit dwelt with the early apostles in the person of Jesus Christ. For in Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and it pleased the Father that in Him, Christ, should all fullness dwell. He is the fullness of God on earth. He is it. Hallelujah. But when he would go away, then he would release the Spirit to the end of thy world, which he did at Pentecost. Then the Holy Spirit came into them. Now a good question comes up here. And I might as well, might as well bring it up. Somebody, we don't, we don't, so many cases we don't read the scriptures correctly. Some people seem to get the idea all the Christians were waiting at Pentecost for the coming of the Spirit. That is not true. They're not even saved till Pentecost. They're Old Testament Christians till Pentecost. When the Spirit came and they received the Holy Spirit, then they become Christians. You're not a Christian until you receive the Holy Spirit. Simple theology, simple biblical theology. That's the way it is. And so they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The activity of the Spirit was limited to the person of Jesus in Palestine. It was the death of Jesus which meant the setting free of the Holy Spirit for all. He had to die and let the Spirit really be released to the world. And again, since believers have the Holy Spirit, we do not expect an absentee Spirit to come down into us. Rather, we expect the Holy Spirit who is in us to enable us to manifest His Spirit in the speaking in tongues. You know, really... Sometimes, I, I so appreciated the answer to prayer you've had last week. I think it's marvelous. So many times it's difficult for us to get answers to prayer simply because we don't know where God is. We just don't know where He is. I guess some Christians have Him two million miles up in the blue somewhere. I don't know, maybe in the black hole, but I'm not sure of that. <laughs> and all the time Jesus had said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. That's right. It's all right here. And we're looking there. No wonder we can't communicate. We don't know where he is. That's right. 
And being people of the old cliches, and uh, I don't, you know, I appreciate the old cliches, but some of us never get around the bend, and a lot of them lost their meaning. We keep telling each other, keep looking up. Looking up for what? <laughs> I walked out of a motel room the other day, and because I was looking down, I found a quarter. <laughs> Well, it's a price of price of a daily paper, you know. I <laughs> Had I been looking up, I'd never seen it. <laughs> but not only that, when you get to my age, I don't look up anyway because I might stumble and break my neck. <laughs> and and the bad thing about doing that is about breaking your neck or any bone is you don't die of the broken bone; you die of pneumonia. And if you're any nurses, you know that. Well, of course. But what I'm saying, the cliches don't help us. Everything's right here. The kingdom of heaven is within you. We somehow have, have overlooked that. Well, we've got to move on. Now, I, I, talk, I talk, spoke a moment ago about this business of tarrying. It's an interesting situation here. I, I, I was in one of our little churches one time, kind of a farming type church. They're tough to preach to. And uh, not only that, I did not read my text from the King James Version, so they already thought I was backslidden. <laughs> but we had a pretty good meeting that morning in a, in a hot country. Boy, it was warm. And I think we had a small church. We had eight get to baptism. I thought that was pretty good for that little church. And uh, the pastor said, asked me if I'd stand at the door and greet people as they went out. And like I say, being the kind man that I am, I greet. And uh, so we're greeting people. And about halfway out, here came a lady. Now, she must have been a holiness woman because she was mean. <laughs> holiness people cannot live up to the standard they set for themselves, so they're mad at themselves and everybody else. The type, you know, no makeup, no jewelry. You, you can use flour, but no powder. <laughs> And she could have used a little makeup. <laughs> but she comes out with all eyes blazing. How come you don't believe in Tarayan? I'd preached an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> I told them all I knew. The dear lady must have taken a nap somewhere. She missed the point. Now she wants a private lesson. And I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm sweaty, it's hot. I'm wanting to get out of there. Now here she wants to go through this thing again. Well, now, I'm, see now, I'm just trying to get away now, see. I said, well, I says, uh, the Bible doesn't teach change. Oh, but you, you read it. I said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. I said, well, where did I read it? She said, Luke 24. Okay, fine. Let's take a look at Luke 24. At verse 49. Now, let me give you the backdrop here. This is after the resurrection, or yes, after the resurrection, just prior to the ascension. Jesus and the disciples are in Jerusalem. They don't have to go anywhere. They're there. And the subject matter is his departing and the coming of the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the subject matter. That's the backdrop to this whole thing. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now, I read several verses there. Nowhere did I see where he told them to tarry. Now, those of you who believe the Bible from cover to cover and word for word, as some of us say we do, you will have to go with what I'm going to tell you. He did say Terry in Jerusalem. Right. <laughs> he did not say Terry in San Carlos. <laughs> 
He never even heard of the place. <laughs> what have we done? We've taken a term or a phrase or a few words out of its context and have given it our own meaning. You have no right to do that. Anytime you take a word or a phrase out of its context, out of its setting, it ceases to be the Word of God at that point. Are you out there? Are you out there? Yes. Yeah, you better believe. This is only the Word of God in context. And the only reason he told him, and incidentally, this is a, a, a timely thing. The only reason he told him, Terry, and Terry is not a holy word, incidentally. All it means is wait. <laughs> if somebody's going to give you a gift, you have to wait till they give it to you, don't you? After they give you the gift, what do you wait for now? Pentecost. Well, we never thought. That's right, we don't think. The gift was given at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. So this has been fulfilled. What are you tearing for now? The Holy Spirit's already here. In fact, if you're saved, you already have him. So what are you waiting on? Misunderstanding of the Scripture. Now, an amazing, you know, you know how I read that? I, I think, let, let me put it in the vernacular. Okay. They were in Jerusalem, Jesus and the disciples. I think they had a lot of conversation, not just King James English. They probably are Hebrew and Aramaic a little bit too, you know. I think when he's up there, I think the conversation might have gone like this. He's talking to them. The Holy Spirit will come. He probably says, now the only thing is, boys, don't leave town till you get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he told them. And we make a great big Terry thing out of it. You know. Now I get amazed. We Pentecostals, not all of us, some of us, are very sentimental type people. I mean gushy sentimental. I've heard people say, oh, they were in the upper room. They were getting ready for Pentecost. And they're searching their hearts trying to get everything straight. It doesn't even talk like that. Where did we get that? We don't know. Somebody said it sounded right. This is not a prayer meeting. This is a harvest festival. They're eating and drinking in the streets, kicking up their heels and shouting the glory and having a good time for the goodness of God for a previous year. They're rejoicing and shouting the glory. And we've made it a gloomy, doomy Pentecost Harry meeting on Thursday night in the church. <laughs> Who wants to go to a meeting like that? <laughs> Prayer meetings ought to be a fun thing. Amen. Oh, hallelujah, God meets his people. You shout a little bit, you rejoice a little bit. This is the harvest session. Yom Kippur is the day they search their hearts. That's when they got everything straight. Not here. They are going to have a big time here. <laughs> and Pentecost ought to be a party. I think the church ought to be a party. Have a good time. Eat and drink and love God and love one another. Jesus is a party God. <laughs> He's going to be the MC at the marriage feast. You out there? Now, you people who've got to be gloomy and holy, you can go home now, I guess. But uh, I just don't care for that at all, you know. And... Of course, I don't even believe that they were in the upper room. It don't say that. It says they were continually in the temple. How did we get them in the upper room? We got them there in Acts 1.13 when they went there. But they left in 1.14 and we didn't catch it. We left them hanging in the upper room while the, prayer, while the meeting goes on down to the temple. <laughs> we missed it. We're not very careful how we read, you see. And then some people say, oh... You know, get real sentimental guy. They're searching their hearts, trying to get right with God. Wait, they don't even talk like that. Let me say something. Some Pentecostal people are not happy people. Because, I don't know who's caused this. Maybe we preachers did in the past. I don't know. We've told people, be sure your hearts are right with God. Oh, be careful about this. Everything will be right with God, you know. And, and we, we, let me say this here. So we keep searching our hearts. The most miserable thing in the world is keep looking in your heart to see what's the matter with you. It'll make you miserable. Because there's no end to what's the matter with you. 
<laughs> like peeling the layers off. There's no end. That's no fun. <laughs> no, here, I, I like, what, I like the, what the song says. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. <laughs> Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. There's holiness. There's righteousness. All in what Christ has done for us on the cross. There's where I'll take my stand. I won't tell him, look what and look what good thing. Oh, no, no, I won't tell him anything like it. I say, Lord, I'm here because you died for me. You saved me. You redeemed me. You gave me the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm here, Lord. That's why I'm rejoicing. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. Well, let's move on. All right. There's a prayer language stored up in your spirit just as there's a natural language stored up in your mind. That's right. We who come to maturity, we get together, we talk to each other. We don't say, now, what am I going to say? No. We just open our mouth and talk, and when you hear people, you know that's exactly what they do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. When, man, when God placed man and woman in the garden, we understand he put them there in a state of perfection. The Bible indicates that. Perfect communication with God. God could accommodate, they could commit, no problem whatsoever. And God said, the day you sin, that day you'll die. And the day they sinned, that day they died. In that, communication with heaven has been broken. No longer can man not communicate with God. He doesn't want to communicate with God. And doesn't until God, by a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit, deals with a man or woman, boy or girl, brings him to himself. He is born again. Then he comes alive to God. That spiritual language comes alive with it. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God forever and forever. John 7, 37 is a key text with us. I don't know how we've overlooked this one. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart, out of his belly, King James, from within him, out of his heart, shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit. Uh... For uh, whom they should believe on, should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus told the lady at the well the same thing in John chapter 4. Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. The point here is this. The blessing is coming from inside up and out. It's not coming from outside down and in. There's part of our problem. We come waiting on God to pour it out. No. I think it's a two cycle thing. You received the Holy Spirit when you got saved. Now we're talking about a release of the Holy Spirit from within and he fills you from inside up and out. And the manifestation comes forward. So beautiful and so simple and we've made it so difficult. One more thing I want to say. And I, I hope I keep it close to tight this time, is this. Uh, sometimes we have become judges of languages. I've been in meetings where somebody's talked to tongues, somebody else who doesn't know anything says, that's not it. How in the world do you know? There are 7,010 languages in the world today. Before you call anything not it, or gibberish, you have to know 7,010 languages. And I doubt that you do. You have no right to do that. And then we discourage people from going on with a prayer language. Don't be a judge of languages. Not till you're a linguist and you're not. <laughs> I was in, no, a very good friend of ours, a lady, told me of a certain meeting. I think about 125 women and a, glo and a globe meeting it was. And a lady had spoken and... Uh, it was in a cafeteria that had lunch and uh, then they were going to pray for ladies to receive the baptism of the spirit so they had a lady up there and they're doing it the old fashioned way they are going to shake it into her <laughs> and then the old stuff hang on sister on the other side let go sister <laughs> confusing commands there 
And it seemed like she was mumbling as in, don't mumble, sister. Talk louder, sister. Talk faster, sister. I guess if you talk faster, you go into second gear, funny into tongues. I don't know. <laughs> but they're giving her the old routine. And it seemed like she's mumbling. Now, sitting in that large congregation are two women from Calcutta, Indian ladies. One was an American, that is, yeah, and married to an American businessman. The other had just come over to visit her sister. Both brought up in the Catholic schools in India, which means they understand the Gospels. And while they're doing that, taking this lady and trying to get her to talk faster and louder, the one visiting sister leans over to the other and says, Sister, do you hear what I hear? This lady was saying in her Hindu dialect, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've come to tell you about Jesus. Yeah. Talk louder, sister. Oh. Poor people didn't know what they were doing. I've been in this so long now that if anybody whistles, chirps, or peeps, I say, Hallelujah! Thank God he got it. Thank God he got it. <laughs> because I'm not a judge of languages. And listen, I'm more interested in what you do with it one, five, ten, fifteen years from now than what you do today. That's right. What are you going to do with it? But we're talking about a starting point today in praying in the Spirit. That's the point. Father, I thank you this morning for your people. Hallelujah. Bless them. Fill them. Those who raised a hand earlier, will you raise them again? No music till the very end, please. Raise your hand all over the house again, those who raised them earlier. Please raise them up high. Those who raised a hand, I want you to stand to your feet. Right quickly, stand to your feet. Hey, Amen. If you didn't raise a hand and you're interested, stand and join in the way. Honey, this is family. Don't be left out. That's right. Anybody else? If you haven't got it, you ought to desire what God's got for you. Just stand and join them. Amen. Anybody else? Will you please come forward? Hallelujah. Give me a straight line across the front. There's something holy about a straight line. <laughs> Amen. Marvelous. Back up just a little. I'll want to walk in front of you. Over here particularly. Hey, it isn't this marvelous. Anybody else? If you haven't got it, honey, don't be left out. That's why we're here. Hey, Amen. It's your church. It's your life. It's your happiness. Amen. Three, six, nine. Beautiful. I want nine Holy Spirit filled people to come stand with us right quickly. Right quickly. Don't lay hands on till we lay hands on together. Now, this is the first group I've seen in a long time who's not chewing gum. <laughs> I generally have to tell people to take the gum out of them. I might swallow it, you know. It happened in one meeting. Now, I want about 10 or 12 people over here to be a prayer group. Right quickly, just any time. You come up and be over here to be a prayer group. I want 10 people in the middle aisle to be a prayer group. Right quickly, come quickly. And I want 10 people over here right quickly. Right quickly. I have a reason for this. Uh, Dennis Bennett, the Episcopalian had our first transdenominational Holy Spirit meeting in Springfield many years ago. And he said this, to receive your baptism of the Spirit, get with those who are praying in tongues and open your mouth and make a start. There's something you have to do. He doesn't make you talk. Then the prayer group. I've called you here, so when we pray, I want you to pray in tongues then. Anybody out in the congregation pray with us in the Spirit when I prayed. No screaming and no shouting, but praying audibly. You all come a little closer over here. And when you hear us pray in tongues, just open your mouth and join in. I was trying to help one group one time. Ladies give us the education. Men don't talk. They believe you or they don't. Women tell you what they think. And it's, ama it's amazing what they think sometimes. I was trying to help a group one time. One lady says, <laughs> you know, talking tongues is a language. She said, well, I'm afraid I might make a mistake. <laughs> I said, who would know? <laughs> One lady says, I'm afraid I might make it up. I said, you're not that smart. <laughs> One lady says, you mean make it come? Sure. If you can talk to one another, you can talk to God. Bennett says, get with us. When you begin to worship, do not worship in English. Open your mouth and just begin to mumble it out in tongues. And trust God for the operation. Everybody's standing real straight now. Hands on high. Hands high. Heads up. Do not bow your heads. Heads high. Heads high. Put a smile on your face and God will think you love them. 
Heavenly Father, I pray now you baptize your people in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's begin to pray in tongues. On the front row, join them. Hey. 